professor of political science here at Paul, and it's my great pleasure to be uh, serving as the moderator for this panel. I'm going to talk exquisitely briefly here to start off, um, introduce our speakers. We're going to give them each 20 to 30 minutes to tell us the possible and open the floor for a conversation. Um, we're fortunate to have two experts here to talk with us about community, university, and heritage of Catholic social teaching, the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Farm. Um, I was thinking of telling my students that it's the 120th anniversary of the Farm, but fearing that they might ask me if I was there. Um, our first speaker, we're going to go from right to left, is Zachary Kahlo. Zachary is an associate professor of law at Valparaiso University. Uh, he's um, Highly educated, in addition to his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law, he holds a PhD in U.S. history, and he's currently a candidate for an additional PhD in religious studies at the University of Virginia. And his work and publications have been, not surprisingly, in the area where law and religion intersect. And our second speaker is Tom O'Brien. Tom's an associate professor of religious studies at DePaul. And an old friend of mine. And Tom is an expert on Catholic social theory, liberation theologies, and applied ethics, and has published on topics of the common good in a business ethics context, and thinking with John Courtney Murray um, with regard to the war on terror, and first Frederick Ozanon's contribution to Catholic social theory and practice. So, no further ado. Thank you. Well, my, my task, is, as I understand it here, is, is to, to speak a bit about the reception of, of Rare Navarre by the American Catholic community. So, so speaking as, as principally a historian, and, and not so much maybe at least at this point, more with the judgments about uh, the character of that reception, but rather to, to think constructively about the process by which American Catholics adopted uh, the document and used it in some fashion as part of the process of constructing uh, a native tradition of, of social ethical reflection. The way that I'm going to, uh, to go about this is uh, to, to focus roughly on the period from the turn of the century through, through World War I, which is the period where I think the, the document was most uh, fluid in ways it began to influence uh, Catholic thought. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, perhaps more, more specifically on, on John Ryan's role in, in, in this process. Uh, I'll, I'll certainly speak in, in some general terms about, about trends within American Catholicism writ large, but there'll be uh, some, some uh, particular focus to, to Ryan's role in, in this process. Uh, I'm, I'm working now on a, on a book about John Ryan's role in, in American Catholic social thought. So, so some of this paper will, will, will consist of, of reading portions of, of, uh, of the draft and other parts will be a bit more extemporaneous. Um, but that's roughly how we'll, we'll pursue this, is to talk a bit about the reception of American Catholic in the general sense and to look at, at Ryan's role uh, more specifically. In, uh, in 1911, well actually I should, I should probably, probably perhaps do this now, I, I often assume that people know more about John Ryan than, than they do, but, but maybe I'm, I'm Brief bit of, bit of words of, of, of background. Um, Ryan uh, lived from 1869 to 1945. He, he was a diocesan priest in, in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, served very briefly in a, in a rural parish in, in, the 18, in the 1890s. He, he completed a seminary at uh, the University of St. Thomas. Uh, was very quickly dispatched in the 1890s by his bishop, John Ireland, as one of the leading liberal figures in the American church, to Washington to pursue his, his doctoral work at the then quite new Catholic University of America. He, he did his PhD in moral philosophy, though studied also quite a bit of theology, sociology, studied economics at Johns Hopkins. Um, so this was at, at the forefront of thinking somewhat creatively and interdisciplinarily, interdisciplinarily that's, that's a term I can, I can, I can import here, uh, about Catholic social thought. 
Um, I'll, I'll have, have more to say about his intellectual biography as we, as we move along, but I take him to be significant both in, in a concrete sense with respect to his intellectual contribution to this process, but also I, I think perhaps even more importantly as a, as a symbolic embodiment of some broader trends that are, that are shaping how Catholics deal with, with uh, the significance of Reverend Farr for, for the American Church. So in 1911, uh, John Ryan, uh, in an article published in, in Catholic World, that a very important uh, journal of, of Catholic scholarship, wrote that no document has had more to say on the social question, and has had so many readers exercised, so, had so many readers who exercised such wide influence in the American church that were ever born. It was 1911. By the early 20th century, Leo's encyclical, he claimed, had aroused a special solicitude for the poor of the world and inspired American Catholics in a vigorous campaign against capitalism. But in spite of this uh, influence that it seemingly had eventually, Bernard de Mar was in fact largely ignored uh, for, for almost two decades after its publication. With, with very few exceptions, I, I, I looked rather systematically through the uh, houses of newspapers and some other sources. There were virtually no references to, to the encyclical in, in Catholic conversations. The 1890s. Um, John Ryan, in fact, laments this, this fact quite often in, in his early career. He, he, he wrote in a, in a speech given you know, some years later that American Catholics have failed to give the encyclical sufficient attention. Uh, a lack of attention, Ryan wrote, that was typical of the treatment accorded the encyclical by the Catholics of the United States for several years after it was issued. He blamed this failure on, on clergy. Who he said, quote, did comparatively little to apply the social teachings of the church, or particularly the encyclical on the condition of labor, to our industrial relations. The number of bishops, Ryan added, who have made any pronouncements in this matter could probably be counted on the fingers of one hand, while the priests who have done so are not more numerous proportionally. This was in a, in a rather important article he wrote in 1909 called The Church of the Working Man. What I think is, is perhaps even more intriguing is, is some commentary by non-Catholics about the, the seeming lack of, of, of attention given the document by the wider church. Uh, the Nation, which was uh, uh, then perhaps the leading uh, journal of progressive opinion, had an editorial in 1892, which it, it, it remarked about the following. The Pope issued the encyclical known as Rerum Navarum some months ago, taking up the cause of labor, urging employers to be more benevolent, to working men to be more faithful, and to respect property as a divine institution, and directing the Catholic clergy to occupy themselves more than heretofore with economical and social questions. It attracted very little attention to the nation, either from labor or from the clergy. It was read in all the Catholic churches, but we believe no attempt to act on it or under it has yet been made by priests or bishops in any, any Catholic country. Now, when Catholics did invoke the encyclical in the late 1890s and, and into the early turn of the century years, it was typically done not in the cause of, of labor or social reform, but of anti-socialism. Uh, many Catholics, John Ryan noted, were under the impression that Pope Leo's statements were confined to a denunciation of socialism. And in a speech he gave, I believe to the Knights of Columbus in 1928, he, he remarked that 25 years ago when addressed by a priest to a body of Catholic laymen on the subject of labor, would have dealt mainly with the nature of the menace of socialism as Catholic leaders who took any interest in the social question were more oppressed by the fear of socialism than by any clear perception of the nature or necessity of social reform. American Catholics, Ryan concluded, misinterpreted the U.S. Pacific. Now, a number of, of, of factors I think we could, we could propose had, had something to bear on why the document was, was received uh, technically and then perhaps uh, in, in a very limited fashion. First, and I think this is quite important for, for our purposes, but I'll have more to say about this later, the encyclical was really written uh, for the European church and, and, and imbibed in many respects a, a worldview deeply rooted, rooted in, the, in the European continent. And, and the conflicts that I see animating the encyclical, Catholicism versus liberalism, capitalism versus socialism, were, were in many respects foreign to, to the experience and, 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 and even more than that, the, the Concerns of, of the American Catholic Church at this time. Uh, American Catholics were engaged in their own struggle to negotiate tensions between Catholicism and modern society. And the Church's European leaders failed, I think, to grasp the extent to which this process was developing along distinct lines. 
The overriding challenge of the American church was not to identify the errors of liberalism, but rather to effect a deeper rapprochement with liberalism. Thus, even as Leo led the church into a more constructive dialogue with modern political ideas, he did so with a tepidity unsuited ultimately to the impulses animating the American church. Of similar importance, although perhaps of a more practical consequence, was, was the American church's preoccupation in the late 19th century with practical concerns, building institutions, assimilating immigrants, uh, addressing uh, the problem of nativism. Between 1880 and 1910, the Catholic population in America grew from 6 to 16 million. And whereas earlier Catholic immigrants hailed chiefly from Ireland and Germany, these new immigrants came primarily from Southern and Eastern Europe. And thus, in addition to creating a church with deep linguistic and cultural divides, immigration forced the church to confront the massive material and spiritual needs of these new populations. John Ryan conceded along these lines that clergy were so consumed with what he described in 1909 as organizing parishes, building churches and schools, and providing the material equipment of religion generally, that they had little occasion or need to think systematically about the structure of social reform. Even had the church perhaps wanted to engage in such activities, it lacked the organizational and institutional resources to do so. The late 19th century church had not yet become a truly national or politically engaged church. Finally, and I think this is also uh, of significance, the early failure of Reverend Navarro to resonate with the American Catholic Church, and we might even say the American Catholic mind, uh, was the byproduct of a certain residual conservatism that, that informed the Catholic community. Nineteenth century Catholics were deeply suspicious of state intervention, which was thought to violate the natural law and divinely ordained norms to the ordering of political economy. American capitalism thus went unchallenged as church leaders at times fondly embraced regular conceptions of freedom. Catholic liberals in particular co-opted the natural law tradition in order to defend laissez-faire against social reform. Neo-Thomistic political philosophy merged seamlessly with post-Civil War liberalism, thereby supporting the claim that Catholic and American political ideals were synchronistic. By advancing this argument, Catholics were left unprepared to critique American institutions. Thus, even as one Catholic commentator wrote in 1893, also in, in Catholic World, that quote, the distribution of wealth is fraught, I'm sorry, is frightful in its very inequalities, the author quickly went on to add that to reform these institutions could not be done without violating any law, human or divine. Now, the church's general lack of, of interest in social reform, I, I think rooted in some of the reasons I've mentioned, uh, left it. Ryan charged in 1924, quote, a class apart for the political debates of the day. Into the late 19th century, one historian has concluded that Catholic journals were left with little, I'm sorry, that Catholic journals were little more aware of the social and economic problems of the growing industrial society around them than they had been dozens of years before. And the church's social mission remained confused, ineffective, and devoid of passion and intellectual depth. Now change did begin to occur uh, during the early 20th century as, as a new generation of social theorists, of labor leaders, and of more politically engaged clerics began to challenge the church's conservative orientation. After years of dormancy, Rev. Novaro finally captured, in the words of the Catholic Register of Kansas City, the mind of American Catholicism, and began to undergird what Ohio State University sociologist James Haggerty, another one of his important new voices of, of Catholic social thought termed, in 1919, a Catholic social program based on the fundamental principles of Leo XIII. The long ignored and cyclical was now being praised, in the words of one Catholic commentator, as the most fruitful and effective principle of industrial peace that has ever been enunciated. So change was, was rather profound, and, and once it developed a certain amount of momentum, quite, quite rapid. Now it's at this point that I would want to return to return, as, as the case may be, to, to thinking about Ryan's role in this process more specifically. And, and as I mentioned at the outset, I think Ryan is, is a significant voice in this process, both as perhaps the leading articulator of, of a movement of which this was a part, and also someone who, who I think embodied in his very uh, intellectual impulses the kind of, of ideas that were, that were pushing church in, in some of these directions. Uh, in, in, in Ryan, I think more specifically, what we see is, is a blending of people's social thought. Uh, which in these years was embodied in references to Leo the Thirteenth, 
Leonine principles. Um, uh, sometimes explicit references to rare form, but, but there were various headings under which was encapsulated uh, papal social thought with uh, a particular form of American liberalism. And, and thus, uh, the overriding aim of this project was to incarnate, in some sense, the principles of, of Leonine social thought into this new and particular historical context. And it is Ryan's role in, in this project that I think is, is ultimately of, of great importance. And this, this very impulse would shape the dominant patterns of Catholic social thought from the turn of the century through, through the Second World War. Rare Navarre for, for Ryan served certainly a symbolic function in, in the need for the church to become more politically engaged. But it also abided for him certain concrete principles of social action. Thus, while the ecclesiastical liberals Ryan encountered as a student at the University of St. Thomas informed his general conviction that Catholicism must engage modern politics on the terms that they set, it was Rare Navarro that initially informed Ryan's beliefs about the proper political aims of the public church. The challenge before the American church, as Ryan understood it, was to appropriate the message of Rare Navarro as the foundation of an authentic Catholic liberalism. A bit of, of narrative then about, about Ryan's intellectual development. One historian suggests that Ryan must have read Rune Navarre in 1894, the date of its publication, when the text of it was published in St. Paul's Diocese newspaper. The first reference in Ryan's own recollections to encounter Rune Navarre was in a philosophy course he took as a seminarian in, in 1894. But it seems in any event, uh, the, the encyclical immediately captured his attention in quite profound ways. And, and given the, the, the general disinclination of, of the late 19th century church to matters of social reform, it's unsurprising that Ryan found the encyclical message in his phrase not only pleasing but reassuring. Ideas to which Ryan had been listening sympathetically to for a decade, growing up, we, we must remember all I want, the populist frontier, Minnesota being really in the, in the center of, of progressive populist political developments in which Ryan was, was deeply sympathetic. And he saw Rare Navarum as, as offering a papal imprimatur to these very ideas that, that he found uh, that deeply to his liking. So Ryan's social thought immediately began to focus deeply on, on Rare Navarum. And, and as he wrote in his own autobiography some years later, he began in 1894 to devote as much as possible of his time and energy to the study of economics, institutions, and social problems. So Ryan devoted the summer of 1894 to study economics, Reading six works as the principles of political economy by the Italian Jesuit Matteo Liberatore, Liberatore uh, the writings of the English Catholic William Lilly, and Richard Eli's uh, Socialism and Social Reform, a very important work in, in American political economy at the time. Most important, Ryan also began to think initially about how to bridge the intellectual gap between Rare Navarro and, and American populist progressivism. And even as a young seminarian, Begin to see important germinations of, of this impulse. If I can, let me let me read at, at some length uh, a, a journal entry that Ryan wrote in November of 1894. Uh, this this was located in, in Ryan's papers at Catholic University uh, in, in, his, in his handwriting. So 1894, reflecting on it, the heading in his journal was the social question, and, and this is what Ryan wrote. In the solution of this question is involved to a great degree the future of religion. Of morality of true civilization. Where then should the priest be, if not in the midst of this movement, restraining the destructionist, encouraging the true reformer, and applying the ethics of the gospel everywhere? This is his paramount duty to apply Christ's teaching to the practical aspects of the problems that confront us. The priest must be able and anxious to point what is in the present system wrong, and to what extent the brotherhood of man means social equality. He must instill the gospel doctrines of justice between man and man, of love for the poor and unfortunate, of denunciation for the plunders of the people, whether these plunders be the lords of commerce or the rulers of the nation. Hence, the social question is for us in great part a religious question. And then Ryan goes on to say the following, which I think is even more revealing. Henceforth, the battles of the church must be fought out on social lines. She will be obliged to make terms with, and I think this is, this is key here, she must be obliged to make terms with the great politics, industrial upheaval, which is inevitable in the course of the next half century. 
Institutions and aspirations will be all important in deciding the future of religion. Theocracy is a thing of the past. The Church must henceforth depend upon her own worth and her own intrinsic adaptability for her successes. How is, the, how is it most likely to succeed? Why, by taking advantage of the prevailing tone of the age, by appreciating its aspirations, and by making these her own insofar as they are conducible to the glory of her divine master, which means simply that she shall make this universal longing for brotherhood and better conditions of life her own, approving it where it is right and pointing the way to the highest practical realization. To do this, she must deal with institutions and systems, not with individuals. She must endeavor to make, make, make men contented here below. She can make them attentive to considerations about the other life. The one thing to be done, then, is to apply the gospel doctrines to present systems and conditions in a practical and fearless manner, to show the world how necessary it is for the true Christianity that men should follow the golden rule. This should be the watchword of those who have been multitudes to Christ. Christian doctrine applied to the social needs of the age. So this is Ryan at, at 25 years of age, a young seminarian who had first read Rare Navarre perhaps only a few months before. And I think you begin to see the, 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 the impulses of what does it mean to blend these deep political impulses with Christian doctrine. Progressivism, Catholic Americanism, and Leonine social ethics begin to merge in a bold new proposal for relating the church to the politics and economics of modernity. It was Ryan's first statement, the first of many, but his first statement on the meaning and content of Catholic liberalism, as it must take shape within the bounds of American politics. Following the American business, Ryan emphasized the need for the church to embrace American political liberalism. Theocracy, Christendom, he wrote, was dead. It is a thing of the past. Political Catholicism must then look to the possibilities of American democracy, not the past glories of Constantinian Europe. Yet unlike his liberal mentors in, in the progressive movement, Ryan's embrace of the age was a precondition for transforming it. By accommodating the great politics of the modern world, the church could bring its vision of justice to bear on industrial civilization, thus already beginning to define the particular contours of a Catholic progressivism one deeply synchronistic in aims with, with the broader currents of American fault, but also distinctly Catholic in its foundations and its orientation. Now, Rerum Novarum, which, which clearly was, was in operation in, in these 1894 comments, also plays a, a deeply symbolic and substantive role in, in Ryan's more serious scholarly writings in the ensuing years. And, and I think no more so than in his, his seminal 1906 words of living wage initially published as his, uh, initially his dissertation at Catholic University, published simultaneously. It was quite, quite remarkable. He defended his dissertation after having a book contract that matter that, that caused some concern to his committee. Uh, it, it was within, within two or three months translated into French, into Italian, into German, and it received phenomenal attention, um, both in the Catholic press and in the secular press. The, the New York Times commended it as an alternative to socialism. The London Pioneer uh, described it as a book that every reformer should endeavor to obtain, and, and of course similar words of praise throughout the, uh, the Catholic press. The book, for those of you who, who are not familiar, was, was a, a rather systematic anthropological justification of, above all, the living wage, but also a panoply of, of, of progressive political reforms. Uh, the eight-hour workday, social insurance, uh, housing, uh, just, it, it was a, it was it was in in, in kind of neo Thomistic bar progressivism of, of, of the day. That was also interesting that there was there was no small amount of criticism of the book, and and far and away the most determined criticism came from conservative Catholics. Uh, Augustine McNally, who was a, a kind of cantankerous voice in these days, wrote in the in the New York World that Ryan's defense of the living wage uh, would lead ultimately to socialism. His radicalism and socialism sleeping in the same bed, locked in each other's arms in serene peace and happy contentment. Uh, another Catholic critic wrote that Ryan's endorsement of the living wage carries him in effect into an unconscious alliance with the British socialism, which as such he abhors. He was denounced on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives as a bitter thorn in the side of many respectable Catholics, as a dangerous revolutionary in clerical garb. Uh, and, and notably, famously, one wealthy donor refused to give uh, any further monies 
to Catholic University, quote, while that socialist is kept in the institution. Right, had, had, had uh, joined, the, joined the faculty by, by this point. Uh, in, in spite of these criticisms, though, interestingly, Ryan continued ever more so to link his arguments on living wage with Reverend Obama. And, and more and more, especially in his arguments to the Catholic community, uh, described the living wage as, quote, authoritative Catholic teaching, referencing as his basis the words of Reverend Navarro. Significant, I think, also, for, for reasons we can, we can talk about uh, later in the comments, but, but the living wage itself never references Reverend Navarro. So the text of this book, Why We Read, Why We Circulated, never once references the encyclical. And it was really only later, when Ryan begins to speak to the Catholic community, that he, he begins to draw on Reverend Navarro. A fact, I think, just to, 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 to reference now without going into, into any great detail, reflects, I think, his dual concerns with, on one hand, speaking to the Catholic community on Catholic terms, but equally so developing alternative rationales for progressivism rooted in natural law and not explicitly theological rationales. This notion that, that Catholics could be good Americans without having to uh, Without having to make recourse to to a, to a Catholic intellectual tradition, still of course viewed with, with deep fear and suspicion from the American modern politic. So there are, in some sense, two Ryans: the Ryan of Rare Navarro and the Ryan of, of of natural law, the Ryan who wrote in the nation, who wrote in the New Republic, versus the Ryan who wrote in common real and who wrote in, uh, in America. I'll, I'll start to, to to bring this to uh, to a conclusion. Um, the living wage. Uh, Ryan's writings on the living wage in, in 1906, I think, are, are significant in that they begin to, to concretize a point of contact between Catholicism and American liberalism. And they begin to, to legitimize the church's emerging political aspirations. Um, but in the end, Ryan's political vision was rooted both in the theological particularities of Catholicism, but also, as I mentioned before, a deep and abiding commitment to American liberalism and American political progressivism. Uh, there are two, two other parts of this story that I think are, are significant, and I won't, I, just to, to be interested in time, I won't go into to any details about these, but uh, Ryan's intellectual development in the years before uh, the end of the First World War. Uh, one is his writings on church state. Uh, I think in many respects, it, the best way to understand what was going on in Ryan's law, and in many ways the idea of percolating in American policy, is not to look at explicitly social, and economic, and political writings, but to look at theoretical engagements with the church state question. And, and Ryan wrote a very famous book in 1921, I believe it was first published, called The State of the Church, uh, which was used in Catholic seminaries as a textbook until Vatican II. And you see in this book uh, uh, very deep echoes of, of things that Murray would say, John Corbin Murray would say, 30 years later. And in this project of trying to operate within the Catholic system while, while articulating a defense of American separation of church and state, he speaks to the need, I think, in Ryan's mind to find a kind of intellectual superstructure for his political project. That there was a need to legitimize uh, political liberalism of the sort he wanted to draw from Rare Navarro by grounding it in a deeper, more elemental um, uh, endorsement of, of uh, American separation, of, of American liberalism, the foundational principle of which is church state separation. Because I think he recognized that the adoption, the appropriation of Rare Navarro would always be uh, somewhat problematic as long as the church state question moved in, in the background. Um, let me, let me, let me uh, there, was, there was another matter which I was going to mention. I'll, I'll hold off on that and just offer a, a very brief uh, concluding remarks. So in, 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 their, in their appropriation of Reverend Navarro, that is both John Ryan and, and the American Catholic community more generally, what I think we see is, is the foundations of an American Catholic social ethic, patterns of thinking that did not merely parrot the encyclical, that didn't merely appropriate Reverend Navarro, but, but begin to draw it into uh, a distinctive, constructive American intellectual tradition. And Reverend Navarro was one component part of a broader series of, of, of thoughts that encompass specific political aims, theoretical aims concerning the compatibility of Catholicism and liberalism, and then as well, the Leonine Court. There were, of course, I, I should just add as a caveat, multiple modes of Catholic reflection at this time. The liberal tradition of Bonnie and Ryan was, I think, far away the, the dominant one. 
but certainly was not the only one. There remained um, various patterns of, of, I think, opposition that were deeply suspicious of, of the, the harmonization of liberalism and, and Catholicism embodied in this project. But I do think what we see in, in, in John Ryan's work is, is, a, is a very interesting expression of, of what John Paul described in Chintese Mazanus as, as the following. He, he wrote that the church has no models to present. Models that are real and effective can only arise within the framework of different historical situations. Through the efforts of all those who responsibly confront concrete problems in all their social, economic, political, and cultural aspects as he's interacted with them. And that was what was happening in the early 20th century American church. It was an attempt to, to, to incarnate within the bounds of a particular historical, social, and economic moment the meaning and meaningfulness of, of rare Navarro. And, and without passing judgment on the, on the, on the normative project itself, which, which was, was deeply rooted in normative assumptions about, about uh, uh, politics and, and political economy, uh, I think what we can see is, is, is the genesis of, of deep patterns of thought that would shape certainly American Catholic social thought in the pre-World War II period, uh, but really with echoes throughout the, uh, the 20th century. So with that, I'll, I'll bring myself to a close for now. Actually, now I know why we were brought together, because in so many ways, what I am going to do here in regards to quantities and auto is, is working off, um, off of what has just been presented by uh, John Ryan and the reception of uh, Mary Barb. Um, First, I'd like to say that I really love Quadrigazima. And I say that as both a recommendation and a warning for what is about to, to uh, transpire. Um, I love Quadrigazima Milano for a lot of reasons. Um, but the most important reasons have a lot to do with the way in which the 1920s and 1930s became erased. Um, after World War II for a lot of reasons. Um, a lot of the ideas, a lot of the ideologies, a lot of what we thought politically, economically, and socially, that is a lot of what Quadrigesimo was all about, got erased and got, and got simplified and placed under you know, certain categories. This is good, this is evil, and for obvious reasons. So anything that had anything to do with fascism or anything of this nature got placed under this heading evil and terrible, and we can't actually engage it on an intellectual level, on an honest level, and understand it for what it is. Because we've already labeled it, and it's already been dismissed. Quadra was one of those things that got dismissed. And if you're a student of um, not just Catholic social theory, but of this era, um, you know that you know, Rare Navarro gets mentioned about 500,000 times more often than Quadrigazimon. And in fact, everything subsequent to Quadrigazimon gets mentioned much more often than Quadrigazimon. Sadly, Quadrigesimo Anno is sort of one of these sad little victims of what happens after World War II. This erasure of anything that reminds us of what caused or sent us into or made us think about all those horrendous things that were really part of World War II. Quadrigesimo Anno is entitled is obviously in regards to the title, is on the 40th anniversary of Rare Navarro, written in 1931. And to a large extent, it is the, you know, a child of Rare Navarro. It makes, I mean, one of the things that, that's amazing why we don't speak more about this uh, encyclical is that it really is the tradition making uh, document. Everyone says, oh, wait, wait a minute, it's Rare New Barn. No, Rare New Barn would have been a one off, historically interesting document. Had Quadridesium on that bottom had not come along and actually written another document on the anniversary of Rare New Barn, 
did a whole 40 paragraph section doing a Reader's Digest version of where I'm from, and a bunch of other things, which gets repeated again and again and again and again. But it's only because of Quadri J's and Milano that this becomes tradition, and not just, oh, isn't it interesting, that thing that you know, uh, we have the 13th kid 120 years ago. For all these reasons, I think Quadri J's and Milano is one of the most important documents of Catholic social theory. Um, it's tradition setting. Uh, it's a document written in the midst of global economic disintegration, the effects of which are just beginning to be felt among average citizens in the form of unemployment, price instability, market collapse at that time. It's just beginning to be felt in 1931. Due to the decreasing economics in its security, the increasing anxiety, people turn to extreme ideological solutions more and more. The popularity of fascist, communist, socialist, and anarchistic movements is expanding by leaps and bounds. The political and social ties that bind societies together are coming apart at the same, uh, at the same time, and Pius XI believed these circumstances were different enough from this context of Rare Rivar that the new social encyclical needed to be written uh, to address these critical developments uh, of the time. Um, what I want to do is take a look, and it's very much what Zach was doing, take a look at this in context. Um, often we read encyclicals as if they really don't have a context, as if these are, and we're very Catholic, so that's what we, what we do. We read these things as eternal truths that don't don't somehow come out of a historical, social, political context. Um, I want to read this as though context means something and context is terribly important. Um, so of course, what is the context? Where, where are we coming out of? Well, we've just had World War I. 1931 is a, is a mere 12 or so years after the end of uh, at World War I. Continental Europe, um, was destroyed, and there's slow economic recovery on the continent. Many unresolved conflicts linger after World War I, and many rekindled conflicts fester, like those that exist in the Balkans. There's, of course, the Treaty of Versailles, which is opposed upon the Germans, and especially those clauses known as the War Guilt Clauses, where Reparations of 132 billion marks are imposed upon the Germans, and reparations are meted out in the loss of territory, uh, expropriation of national, natural resources, has all gone on during the 1920s. This causes hyperinflation in the German economy, and the German economy descends into depression for the better part of the decade, the 1920s. Desperation breeds political radicalism, and we see political radi radicalism um, emerging and festering throughout Europe during the 1920s. Also, in the, in the previous um, decades, in the decades previous to Quadrivia we have the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Um, we have communistic, economic, and social structures being established very rapidly. Um, the Leninist regime begins proselytizing outside of Russia, and especially focusing on the United States. And something people in the United States are unaware of is that uh, there was a whole lot of proselytizing here, primarily because it would, the United States was expected to be the next to fall, so to say, to communism. It, and from the communist perspective, we were right a number of smaller nations on the western border of Russia began falling within Russia's sphere of influence. And the liberals and communists' view of one another as opponents vying with each other and inimical to one another's existence begins to develop. At this time, there's also this maturation of industrial capitalism, so moving from the political now to an economic context. Capitalist economic structures have penetrated most of Europe and the Americas, even in the more remote locations, and this was not true in the late 19th century, which is why Leo XIII 
could title his encyclical Rare and Navarro on new things, because capitalism and industrial capitalism is still new for large swaths of Europe. It's really very much an urban reality, you know, at the time of Rare and Navarro. It's not so much an urban reality by the time we get 40 years later, Quadrigues and Blanc. Capitalism is not something that can be treated as new, uh, even by those of the ancient regime in France. Many of the demands of the, of the social Catholics, um, Rare Navarum, and the labor movement were being incorporated into the laws of the liberal nations. And in fact, by the time we get to, to 1931, um, uh, we've already had depression in the United States, and you know, although of course uh, Roosevelt has not been elected president yet, we have the beginnings of you know uh, a change in the United States politically that's going to last over the next you know uh, decade and a half, and John Ryan is going to be a very important part of those changes where we eliminate the elimination of child labor, uh, the right to organize and strike, living wage, limited working hours, safer working environment, things that some things that have already happened in Europe are going to be happening in the United States. Um, domestic consumer markets are beginning to mature, mechanisms of tracking progress and tracking data were beginning to be established. Experts known as economists were developing models to predict economic performance and behavior. Something that economists don't actually exist at the time of Rare Navarro. Or if they exist, it's in kind of an unusual form. Now we have professional economists and actual things going on in universities where you can, where you can major in economics and these sorts of things. Of course, there's global economic depression, stock markets crashing um, due to unregulated trade. Um, speculative and overpriced stocks. Um, unemployment follows, uh, growing rapidly into double digits, and hyperinflation is followed by debilitating deflation. In Europe and in the United States, ultimately, there is a rise of fascism. Um, it gains popularity during and immediately after World War I, and is seen as a viable alternative to liberalism which is blamed for the chaos uh, and competition that leads Europe into World War I. Um, liberalism is understood as weak, and uh, liberal states are understood as chaotic and incapable of addressing uh, the needs of, of Europeans after World War I. Italy brings the fascist government of Benito Mussolini to power in 1921, and um, Initially, anti-clerical, it's, it's an anti-clerical movement, and at odds with Roman Catholicism. Eventually, the Italian fascist state signs a concordat with Rome in 1929, known as the Lateran Treaty, um, which made Catholicism the official religion of Italy, and recognized uh, the Vatican City as a sovereign and independent state. Some people take this as evidence that Catholicism becomes fascist, or that there are many fascist elements uh, in Catholicism at that time. I would have problems with that casting of, of, of the situation. Genuinely, uh, Catholicism feels itself in truth and battle in the fascist state. It finds itself in a context in which it's fighting for its life, literally. Many clerics have been killed. Many clerics have been attacked. Um, Rome believes itself to be near extinction. Um, through some real political sleight of hand, they get this concordat signed with uh, Mussolini. And at this time, Mussolini recognizes that his popularity, he can't really um, uh, do a lot of the things he wants to do, accomplish many of the things he wants to accomplish without the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church in many ways is sighing the sigh of relief that they can sign this concordat. And 
does not see itself as in any way allied with the fascist state, they're, they're, from what I read and how I see it, it's more the church is relieved that they're not going to go into extinction, you know, hopefully in the next few years. It's, it's the fascist state will attack them, and we're hoping that will happen. Um, fascism and Catholicism um, begin to share a common interest in this corporative organization of the economy. And of course, by corporative, we're talking about, we're referring to the term corporate and corpus and body. And this is another thing that some authors have used to say, well, Catholics were the basic inspiration for you know, fascist corporatism, and Catholics embraced fascist corporatism and became fascists um, themselves. Um, in truth, there's significant difference between the very traditional Catholic ideas of society as a corpus, corpus or a body and fascist ideals about this. For instance, fascism viewed this as a very top-down authoritarian imposition of corporatism, where Catholic social theory is really much more of a bottoms-up syndicalist organization of corporatism. Nevertheless, they do share very authoritarian conceptions of hierarchical order and are focused on an idealized, idealized notion of the family as the basic building block of society. Those are some background things. They want to get into how does quadragesimo address ideology in its context? In its you know, fascist Italian context, how does it address corporatism? How does it address fascism, socialism, capitalism, communism, all these other things? And ultimately, this is what sets quadragesimo apart from virtually anything that come, came before and has come since. Because more than anything else, the, the apex of this uh, document, where it comes to its, you know, um, where it comes to its moment of uh, climax, is when it's addressing these ideologies. Clearly, this is why it was written. You know, when you read through Quadrigesimo Yapano and you get to paragraph 89 and go through paragraph 110 or 212, you realize, ah, this is it. This is the meat and the potatoes. Um, and this is why it was written. Syndicalist corporatism. This is, this is sort of the ideology that Quadra J.C. Milano is endorsing. And of course, oddly enough, Quadra J.C. Milano becomes this flashpoint after it's written. Some claim that Quadra J.C. Milano is silent on fascism, strangely enough, and morally culpable for that silence. Others claim that Quadra J.C. Milano endorses fascism. So that, that's the age in which this thing was written. It was very divisive. The authors of Quadrigesimo Milano more likely understand their task as an opportunity to redirect Italian fascism in a politically delicate environment. That's more likely what's going on. They don't believe they're going to overcome Italian fascism, and if they speak out too much against it, they're afraid they're going to be you know, put out of existence. But they do think they can address it and redirect it. Because we just signed a concord out before. Maybe they'll listen to us. Quadra J. Zimolano defines a neologism, which all of us may know, subsidiarity. This term directs the authoritarian strain of corporatism in the Italian fascist state. Corporatism from a Catholic perspective would build from the ground up rather than impose from the top down. Subsidiarity is the principle that humanizes corporatism. Quadrigesimo Anno then explains <coughs> its understanding of the proper relationship between economy and the state. Like all conceptions of corporatism, the political economy is conceived in terms of the human body. 
This organic understanding of the state is one in which conflict would be abolished and replaced by harmony and cooperation. This, of course, is an entirely different way of conceiving conflict than other political systems of the day. For liberalism, conflict is manageable. For communism, conflict is necessary for the overthrow of the oppressive bourgeois. For, for this version of corporatism, it's harmony, not conflict. And, it, and harmony overcomes conflict. Conflict between labor and capital, outlined earlier in Quattro de Simano, is not resolved appropriately by either liberalism or communism. Liberalism re re resolves conflict in favor of capital, ensuring permanent resentment and resistance from labor. Communism resolves the conflict through the war against capital, obliterating an entire class within society. Catholic corporatism believes it resolves the problem of social conflict through an ordering of the social body in such a way that the members, quote, have their place according to positions each has in the labor market, but according to the respective social functions each perform. Working from a Thomistic understanding of society as a body, Roger Jason Milano goes on to discuss the strong bond that holds a corporatively organized society together in this harmonious arrangement. Society gets organized according to different industries and professions, and each one of these divisions has a degree of autonomy as well as a role that is defined and a duty that is uh, a responsibility to the whole body. Ultimately, all human concerns are subsumed within the state which is a sum of all of the various associations that persons within that society find common. In this way, there are no minorities vying for survival and finding themselves marginalized as one finds in liberal democracies. However, this isn't the kind of collectivism that tells people what they want and how they will live. It is the kind of totalitarianism in the sense that it that it includes the totality of all human endeavors and addresses the needs of the entire human person. This is actually the original sense of the term totalitarianism, this kind of idea. The totality of humanity is recognized by the state and in some level organized within the state. A pause, just briefly. Was Quadratismo endorsing fascism? By this time, Italian fascists had all but given up on the idea of corporatism, actually. They had seen the light of free market capitalism, and for the more cynical observer, they had been bought off by the industrialists and financiers. Fascists were already redefining their economic beliefs to more closely mirror their public-private partnerships and the crony capitalist practices that would become the hallmark of the more mature fascist state. Corporatism was more and more understood as a romantic fantasy of the early fascist idealists. Even authoritarian corporatism, let alone the more grassroots corporatism the Vatican was endorsing, was recognized as thoroughly impractical, not to mention unprofitable. Quadratismo, Otto, and Catholic social theory never endorsed militarism, authoritarian nationalism, the ran random commission of violent and uh, violence to promote unity and national identity, and the blurring of individual identity within the cultural identity. Nevertheless, Quadratismo Otto does endorse a bottoms-up version of corporatism. The church itself is modeled on an authoritarian organized structure. It is promoting a singular collective identity that opposed individualism, and they preached nonviolently against uh, opposition and conflict. Therefore, Quadratismo Milano and the Catholic Church together have an ambivalent relationship to fascism and the Italian fascist state. On the one hand, they are promoting a grassroots version of the same corporate organization of political economy and the early fascist idealists. But they also, in many ways, um, are the very model of an authoritarian state, something that the fascists admire and even model themselves on. However, on the other hand, the church rejects collectivism and the idea that the individual identity can be and should be absorbed by the cultural identity. They also reject violence, conflict, 
militarism, and um, other forms of aggression that are the modus operandi of the fascists. Wrap up um, just by mentioning some other things. From this point in the, in the letter, Quadrigesimo Ano moves then to address capitalism. And capitalism is condemned um, almost in and of itself. It's not entirely, but, but it comes close to condemning capitalism. Um, it's, it talks about how agrarian communities are being crushed by industrial capitalism, um, how it is a persuasive ideological system that's become pervasive and can be found in every all realms of society. Um, but ultimately, the consequences of, of capitalism are that it concentrates power. Concentrates power both economically and by those reasons politically. And because of this concentration of power, there's a struggle for economic supremacy. The winners of the fight then engage in a bitter fight um, to gain supremacy within the state, to wield the power at their disposal, and the conflict then spills over and becomes conflicts between the states themselves. And the ultimate consequences are that an economic dis dictatorship supplants the free market, and unbridled ambition for power succeeds greed for gain. Quote, in a quote really reminiscent of Thomas Hobbes, um, all economic life has become tragically hard, inexorable, and cruel. Just as Dr. Thomas Hobbes said that um, human life would become solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Then the Pope, after, after capitalism, goes on and addresses socialism. Communism is immediately condemned because of its unrelenting class warfare, absolute extermination of private ownership, and hatred of the church. However, certain kinds of socialism receive higher praise from Quadrides Milano than any other functioning economic system. He says it's more moderate, it rejects violence, it rejects class struggle, and accepts private ownership of property. This kind of socialism inclines toward, and is, in a certain measure, approaches the truths which Christian tradition has always held sacred, for it cannot be denied that its demands at times come very close to those uh, that Christian reformers of society just insisted upon. In the end, the Pope, the Pope doesn't come to endorse socialism. In the end, of course, the Pope condemns socialism along with all of the other systems. He only comes closest to praising socialism, um, much closer to praising socialism than he comes to any other um, system in this um, letter. In conclusion, Padre J. Zumo Anno is written during a time of partisanship, ideological division, and economic collapse. In other words, it is written in a time much like our own. It was written from the perspective of an institution that was delicately balanced on the brink of political extinction with a hostile right-wing fascist state that had only recently acknowledged its right to exist. In recent years, the papacy has come under renewed criticism for its passive and silent response to Nazism during World War II. Quadridesimo Adam, Pius XI, and the, his Secretary of State, Cardinal uh, Eugenio Vicelli, who would become Pius XII, have been named as co-conspirators in a Vatican plot to either hide in cowardice from or to tacitly support the fascist regimes of that era. Studying Quadrides Milano helps to shed some light on the controversy. The church was trying to address a hopelessly divided European social, political, and economic context from its own politically delicate position within the fascist Italian state. It condemns capitalism, and communism in no uncertain terms. It gives credit where credit, credit is due to socialism, but falls short of endorsing it. It proposes a bottoms-up version of syndicalist corporatism that is informed by its own concept of subsidiarity at a time when mainstream fascism had all but given up on corporatist conceptions of the state as impractical and unprofitable. Later in his pontificate, 
Pius XI feels compelled to reaffirm his anti-communist and anti-fascist bona fides, because there are those who accuse him of being communist, a communist sympathizer, while others claim he's a fascist. In 1937, he publishes encyclicals Divini Redemptoris, which excoriates communism in no uncertain terms, and Mit Redemptoris Sorda, which denounces Nazi atrocities and condemns its ideology. During World War II, fascist and anti-clericalism rears its ugly head, and Catholic clergy around Europe were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. At Dachau alone, 3,000 priests were imprisoned, and 1,034 did not survive. Vatican silence during World War II is likely explained to a large degree by the belief that speaking out against Nazism would only encourage and inflame fascist anti-clericalism, leading most probably to the imprisonment and execution of more priests and bishops. Thank you, John. Yes, it's here for a panel. And now we'll open the floor for questions directed at either or both of the panelists. Well, I'll leave you off. Um, what I hear from both of you is a strain of the Catholic social thinking being fundamentally conservative. Uh, fundamentally conservative. Um, allowing for reform of the social order, but pulling back from radical changes that would be stable the social order. Am I, am I hearing you correctly? To answer that question, at least in the American context, I'll, I'll keep it there for the moment, would require teasing out what we mean by conservatism and liberalism. Uh, part of the challenge, I think something was lost in translation on, on the American side of things, in that what was embodied in the conservative elements of Reverend Navarro, who would call him that, were routinely contextualized in, 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 in European tensions that, that didn't translate all that well into the American context. The, the conservatism that, that I spoke about in the American variant of, of conservatism was had echoes, certainly, I, I, I think, of, of its European counterpart, but, but, but was, less, was less animated by the, the dichotomies that, that you saw in Europe. Um, American conservatism, well, I mean, there are a couple of dimensions, I think, to, to American conservatism as a, as a take shape of it. Catholic Church, really, in, in, in the mid to late 19th century. There was a conservatism rooted in language and in culture. But it was not an ideological conservatism. It was one uh, that, that stood against the predominance of, of the, the uh, Irish Anglo Church. Uh, there was a conservatism that was suspicious of the project embodied in Ryan. Uh, of creating this deeper synchronicity between Catholicism and American democratic liberalism. Less so, I think, at least in its popular manifestations on, on profoundly intellectual terms and more on cultural terms. Uh, then there was certainly, and I think this is perhaps the, the point of contact that we might uh, be able to, to, to tease out even further. I mean, there was certainly an element of conservatism in the American Catholic that echoes what you might see in these papal documents that was that was rooted in a sense of conservatism as uh, a, a politics of orderliness. Orderliness understood as um, 
seeing political authority as necessarily rooted in at once the natural law and ultimately some conception of divine authority that uh, was necessarily problematized by church-state separation and by liberalism more generally. I think, though, why, why most of the dominant forms of American Catholic social law were able to, to move beyond that rather, rather easily was, was, was the, the ability to reformulate the problem. Um, such that, one thing I, I, I didn't have a chance to speak about, but what you see in Ryan's thought, and, and actually this is echoed in, in deep and interesting ways throughout the American Catholic community, especially in the 20s, is, is a really intriguing intellectual move which starts to do this. It's, it's to define the Catholic Church as, and this is, this is a phrase that Ryan used in a, in a speech, and I, I appropriated it for, for a title of an article once, the indispensable basis of democracy. So what you start to see are these interesting patterns of thought that say, not only is there no fundamental incompatibility between Catholicism and a certain form of democratic liberalism, but even more than that, Catholicism has alone the moral and the intellectual and the religious resources to create a kind of career that's sustainable liberal democratic order. And the ability to, to, to embrace that line of thinking which I think you, you actually see echoes of it in Murray's distinction, the sort of, sort of formulation of, of uh, the First Amendment as an article of peace. It's not ideological, it's pragmatic. Ryan talks about this in terms of continental liberalism. That's bad. That's, that's ideological, it's anti-clerical, it's fundamentally defined against the Catholic Church with what he describes as American liberalism. It's, it's, it's benign, it's genteel, it's open to, and indeed profoundly receptive to religious insights. And, and there's something fundamentally American about the capacity to, to, to very sanguinely embrace uh, democratic liberalism in that way. So I mean, we've gotten a long way, I suppose, away from, from your question, but I think it does get to this problematic of why, why conservatism either dissipated by and large in the American church in these periods, or to the extent it, it, uh, it, it remained, was, was oftentimes rooted in, in, in not in, 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 in theological opposition, but, but in something something more cultural. Uh, I should say, I mean, just as, as an important caveat, though, uh, there were there were some interesting um, kind of counter conversations in the American Catholic community, focused above all in, in Midwestern, German, and especially Jesuit communities, uh, where you had, and we really see this flourish is, is actually in the thirties. So some of it's in the 20s, but it really takes off with Padres and Milano. And, and I think, I haven't done a lot of systematic work on this, but I think you could see the publication of Padres and Milano as, as providing, through the language of subsidiarity, of its corporate elements that you spoke about, new intellectual ammunition for the cultivation of, of a new and more interesting and ultimately more mature American conservatism. But, but that was something new. That conservatism was not so much a holdover from conservatism as it had meaningfulness in, in a 19th century European context. It was something quite new. And, and one last remark, and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll shut up here. Um, that Midwestern conservatism uh, was, was deeply theological in a way that the liberals never were. And as I mentioned before, John Ryan's Living Wage never mentions Bruno uh, Barr really has little to say in way, by way of theology. It's not a theological treatise; it's a philosophical treatise. There's a lot of there's a lot of theological background, but 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 it's not. It doesn't proceed from uh, the dignity of the human person as a theological category. It rather starts with a kind of universal rationality, in, in which I think in some ways represents the, the worst of, of, of neo-Thomism. But 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 some of the conservatism. Uh, of the 1930s as it took shape was, was theologically interesting. It was much more about theology as counterpoint to liberalism, as liberalism is fundamentally irreconcilable with authentic communities understood within Christian proclamation. Um, but but as, I, as I sort of think through this in my own mind, I think that was something new, not, not conservatism as it took shape in, in American law. Um, what was that to say? In, in Part of this presentation certainly brings up a lot of issues in regards to this term conservatism, and certainly from this from the context of 
of the Catholic Church itself, I think it bears mentioning that um, conservative in Europe and the conservative elements in Europe are really the, the ancient regime, the, the uh, old aristocracy, with whom the church has been allied for a very long time, and many, many hundreds of years. And Reverend Navarum is this signal break with that. Um, and in that way, it's in many ways radical, not conservative. It's the church coming to realize that this, this ancient regime, this old order of aristocracy and feudalism and landed um, aristocracy is coming to an end. And we have to address, we as church have to begin to address a whole new world and a whole new world context. And we have to find our way in that world. And Rare Navarum is their social, political, economic um, manifesto of, well, here's who and what we are in this very new world. Now, of course, there's, there are a lot of things that are very uh, nostalgic about Rare Navarum. And even there are many passages that talk about how only, uh, if we'd only turn to the Holy Roman Empire again, everything would be all right. Now, did you hear us, Europe? You know, we don't expect you to hear us because you haven't been hearing us for the last God knows how many decades, but still we want to say, if you'd only wake up and return to an order of things as they were maybe 500 years ago, you'd be all right. But you're not going to go there, we know that. So, with that in mind, here's where we go. And so there's a way in which this is a radical break. Um, in an American context, uh, I just kind of want to add on to some of the things Zach was saying, some of the rich things he was saying about um, John Ryan and others, and talk about Americanism in the United States in the late 19th century, something that's not, we don't, we don't hear much about, but was very influential. And of course, John Ireland was was the poster boy of Americanism. And you know, it begins in the mid-19th century uh, with Isaac Hecker and the Paulists, and it, eventually it begins to gather a storm, and it becomes a huge controversy within the United States with John Ireland on one side, and you have bishops from Rochester and other places on the other warring with each other, one saying, the American political um, system, the American spirit, is the true Catholic spirit, and these two will will rise together, you know, um, and these things will, uh, the, the Catholic Church will thrive in the United States and all these other sorts of things. And then on the other side, you had a whole other voice saying, no, 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 uh, it's not that America is evil, but you know, America isn't perfect, and the Catholic Church really, and its way of organizing things, is the way Catholics should think about themselves. And there was this kind of, not just kind of, but there was this real war that went on. Ultimately, the Vatican resolves this war by issuing Longi Qua Oceani, uh, and saying, and condemning uh, Americanism, along with all the other things they've condemned in the late 19th century. And this happens in, in 1896, which is only five years after Rare Navarro. And to a degree, that conservatism that Zach is, is pointing at has a lot to do with really what American Catholic progressives were doing. It was really the American Catholic progressives who were saying the American political and economic system is, is the system that is the most blessed by God and all these other sorts of things. That, that was kind of the seedbed of conservatism among you know, uh, American Catholics who said, yeah, it is. And we don't need to change our economy. We don't need to change our political structures. Because John Ireland and others are saying America is the best political, economic organization that the world knows. So oddly enough, it was American progressive Catholic voices who were creating this kind of thing that we think of as conservatism in the sense of kind of putting its blessing on the American political economy. I'd like to make a response to yours and ask a question 
future. I don't think it's conservative at all. I think it's incredibly centrist in the grand scheme of things. At the same time that these Americans or Catholics are having their little squabbles, and the European, there's a whole group of, uh, uh, you guys know much more about this, like wobblies and other kinds of anarchists that are they were talking the whole bloody thing. Um, social order in both continents. And in the grand scheme of all the political ideas that are available at the moment, uh, these Catholics are incredibly pragmatic, saying we've got to get some people housed, fed, clothed, get a job, and get, get the orphans taken care of and the dead people buried. And such that Catholic social thought, because of its, it has to include an element of eschatological fulfillment, it's never earthly fulfillment. Um, it's never, it's, and it, because of its eschatological belief and its practical concerns about getting people taken care of, it's going to be, to my mind, not conservative, but wonderfully moderate in the grand scheme of, of everybody that's getting their books in. It's going to be, a, if, if, if Raymond if Ray LeBron got received with indifference and ignorance in the United States, its reception in Europe was, was very different. Uh, it was strongly negative by anybody that had any kind of social position. Uh, what is this Pope becoming? Uh, bring us back Pius IX, bring us back the syllabus of errors, and these guys are responding to the loss of the papal states as well as everything that's going on. And so they, to my mind, he winds up with this incredibly moderate position in light of both history and then the real practical concerns of uh, the people that are writing it. Um, um, that's, the, that's my kind of comment here. Uh, is it conservative? No, not in the grand scheme of things. It's moderate for real practical and theological reasons. Which brings me to my question for you two. Uh, is this, are these documents, if memory serves, and I, and I would love to be corrected if I'm wrong, these are, are, are written by clerics. This is before the days of much late participation in the creation of knowledge the creation of, of Catholic teaching, because Catholic, Catholic, there are no lay Catholic theologians in the period contributing to the discussion, and so the people that are writing these documents are taken up in their everyday life of living in two worlds, the, the other one and this one, um, taken up with, um, and so their interests and concerns are certainly going to be with this world, but they're saying daily mass and burying the dead, they're also off in some other world and have their thinking. And so what they generate, the kind of documents they generate, are not the kind of documents a lay person might, but they're the kind of documents that a, a, a very savvy, smart cleric would generate. And being a very smart, savvy cleric, you got incredibly practical things to think about, as well as this world is passing, as so are people in it. Is it accurate to say that the writers of these documents are not lay people with lay concerns, but are clerics coming out of the clerical world and clerical concerns? I think you probably know more about the, the intellectual history of who drafted these. And Monte Cristo was drafted by a series of Jesuit advisors, right? Again, and one, or, one or two in particular have kind of a And, um, Charlie, Pius XII, uh, has, has a hand in, in its writing as well, as well as in the writing of Divini Redemptoris. Um, so it's not just clerics, it's clerics, it's not just, you know, you, you, saying clerics would mean, well, everyone who is a cleric. Well, it's clerics at a certain very high level of like clericalism. They, they probably aren't the kinds of clerics that are doing people. And they're the kinds of clerics that are doing uh, the mission of the state all day long, the back of the state all day long, and do have even more of a divorced sense of connection with the lay concerns. <laughs> Nevertheless, Graham Navarro is, is um, there are many influences on Graham Navarro that are, that are from people who are lay people, from the social Catholics, um, and, you know, who really have their roots much earlier in the 19th century, 
Frederick Ozanam being one of those people. Um, but Frederick Ozanam and a lot of those people who were gathered around his movement and became the social Catholics have a very unusually powerful impact on rare reform. So um, while it's fair to say that you know, most papal encyclicals are uh, products that are very elite products, uh, rare the Varum, and to a different degree, Crocker J.Z. Milano. I think Crocker J.Z. Milano is not as influenced by the concerns of the lay people uh, as Baron of Arm was. And that just had to do with the isolation, I think, of, of the Vatican at that moment in history. In the late 19th century, the Vatican wasn't nearly as isolated as they were uh, by the time we get to the 1930s. And the sense of isolation they have from not just laity, but from anybody outside of the Vatican City. Um, I have uh, two questions and comments. The first one, um, with hindsight, I wonder whether the you know the Leo the Thirteenth would have issued a different kind of incident, and whether the, the you know, Pius XI would have issued a different kind of incident. Uh, for example, uh, you know it has been pointed out in many. Uh, studies of the Catholic social tradition, for example, in the case of Red Novarum, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the, the, the appeal is always to those in power to have mercy, to have compassion on the working class. It never tells the working class to rise up, you know, to defend their own. There's no sense of empowerment. Now, remember the 19th century was a, a century in which the church rose to the working class, uh, more or less. They were leaving the church because of this situation there. So the question is whether the church took the situation seriously enough as to be able to empower the working class so as to be on their side. Now, while we are speaking with hindsight approach, uh, I wonder whether uh, you know that would have been possible under those circumstances. Even with regard to the uh, to Father Desimano there, uh, well, always you know saying you are right but you are wrong up to this point and so forth to, to be very comprehensive to be very careful in many ways, but it does not point to the real real crucial issues, you know, highlighting them, focusing on them. Of uh, condemning them with an, with a uh, uh, unambiguous kind of uh, uh, emphasis and so forth. Uh, uh, so my question is whether uh, maybe the, those two uh, encyclical could have been written in a different way, could have had a different kind of appeal, you know, with hindsight. That's my first question, uh, and of course it can be said about all the other subsequent encyclicals too. Whether they would have been done better. The second one, uh, you know, it has been said many times that the, the, the social uh, uh, the teaching tradition is one of the best kept secrets of Catholicism. Uh, why is it that uh, at the highest level of the magisterium, the, the, the church has, a, has developed a very a uh, very important kind of a tradition of doctrine of, uh, uh, of our social, political, economic life, and so forth, all the way from Red Mabara to the most recent one, and so forth. And yet, how often do you actually see those things preached from the book? Yeah, I, uh, and uh, that raises the entire question of uh, how American Catholics, for example, uh, whether it had an impact on the American Catholic in terms of their view of politics, of uh, the role of America in the rest of the world, and so forth, you know. So the Vatican comes up with a strong condemnation of, say, American imperialism in Iraq, and so forth. And yet American Catholics, and when they go to church, they say America the beautiful. You know. I say um, amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the first question, I, I think is a fascinating question. I ponder this all the time, often in front of the class. Who's the audience 
And I think that's really your question. Why didn't they address? Why didn't they address workers? Why did they address captains of industry and, and the uh, aristocracy? Primarily because that's. I don't think when they when Graham Navarum was written that there was any assumption that they were addressing anybody else other than other bishops and the aristocracy. That's who we're addressing. We're not even really even addressing capitalists. I mean, we're, we're complaining about them, and we're going to say how bad they are, but we're really not talking to them. We're talking to each other as bishops, and we're talking to the aristocracy. Those are the ones who are going to pay attention to us, because that's whom we've addressed for I don't know how many hundreds of years. So it was coming out of that expectation. That's why I knew they were addressing who they were. Padre Daisy Milano no longer has an aristocracy to address, or really no longer a significant aristocracy to address. They are talking to other bishops, but I think there's an awareness that we're talking to the Italian state, and we're also talking to state leaders all around the world. So Padre Daisy Milano is also addressing, I think, a broader audience, and, and still a lead audience, still not talking to the working class, yet you can tell there's a difference in audience, I really think. When you read through Rare on the and then read through Quadra Days in Milano, Quadra Days in Milano has a broader uh, audience, and actually it's a, more, it's a more intellectually sophisticated and broad audience, and you can just tell. It explains what it means by socialism. Remember, Navarro never explains what it means by socialism, it just condemns it. It never really explains capitalism. Rare Navarro explains it. This is what it is. Here's how I find it. And it's a pretty cogent explanation. You know, it's not just, oh, capitalism's awful, let's move on. Um, so there are two different audiences. They're both pretty elite audiences. Rare Navarro is a less a traditional audience than Rare Navarro. And eventually, of course, later on in, in Catholic social theory, the popes become aware that other people are actually reading this, you know, and, and suddenly start addressing. So in 1961, we have Madre Magistra addressed to, you know, everyone, all the people who could have done that sort of thing. They're all along with Pajam But, you know, these, these are not, you know, the addresses to the different Just Just very briefly, uh, certainly in, in, in the American context, the the so-called captains of industry, to the extent that there were captain, captains of industry, and that was a rather minimal group at, at this point in time, they heard the message, they just rejected it. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of interesting historical documentation showing the, 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 the we might simply say, disregard of, of the message of Rare Navarro by uh, persons of, of, of a certain social, social location. Um, which I think raises for me, to, to, to direct this more at, at, at your question, could this have been a different document? Which would lead me to say, I think one reason why it was able to, 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 to be either rejected or ignored is, is, is that Bernard de Barbe was not a particularly theological document. It wasn't framed in terms of your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ demands that you do X. I mean, the very nature of the document framed as both a, a philosophical appeal uh, intermingled with certain pragmatic uh, conclusions that emerge from that seems in my mind, just, just thinking about this uh, for the first time now, to, to, to create a certain space for for disconnecting Rere Navarro from, from one's life in the church. Uh, so, so a simple answer to your question might be, it could have been a, a profoundly more theological document grounded in the nature of the church and the proclamation of Jesus Christ as opposed to, to a certain form of, of neo tubistic philosophy. There is a very, just, just um, one other thing as well, is, is that character of Rare Navarro also allows, at least in, 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 the, in, in the U.S., I, I don't know as much how this played out in the European context, but it allows for uh, the document to be ca captured, I mean, I use that as perhaps a loaded term, but it allows the document to become very much the province uh, of the emerging social sciences. Where this document is given attention is not uh, among theologians or philosophers, but by the, these newly emerging disciplines of, of economics. That there's a gigantic school at Catholic University founded in the 1890s, in which John Ryan is a faculty member of the School of Social Work. 
Uh, uh, a lot of the people working with this in Catholic circles were sociologists. So, so interestingly, I think the location where, where this document is deemed to be of, of most pronounced importance is not as a document for the church in, in a kind of elemental sense, but rather as a provincial document which might inform the work of, of these new disciplines. Now, there's, a, I mean, there's a, a fascinating question to explore. I will proffer a thesis here, but is why the Catholic Church didn't lose the American working class, um, at least as compared to, to Europe in, in the early 20th century. Uh, the, I, I don't recall the exact numbers, but, but the American labor movement was well over 50% Catholic. So there's, I mean, there's an interesting question to be, to be wrestled with there, why the church was able to, to retain, in some sense, the loyalties of, of the working class in a way that, that didn't happen in Europe, and I suspect it's related to this puzzle, but, but that's probably a, a different question. Well, we've used up our time productively. Always a worthwhile goal. I thank you all for your attendance and your attention, and I especially thank our speakers for presentations I find very clarifying and illuminating to my own understanding of these documents and the context and their effects and the world. Which they landed. Thank you very much.